Thank you. Thank you so much. It is uh, an honor to be here. Um, <laughs> And it was kind of a miracle. Um, I got the call, uh, or I got a, a, actually an email um, from Pastor Phil. I guess it was Sunday or something, saying, "Sorry, we don't have any. We don't have any electricity. We can't do it. I'm so sorry." So we canceled the flights, and we canceled the flight from Dallas to here. We put another flight from Dallas to New Jersey to go home. Um, and then uh, after we did that, I got another message from Pastor uh, Phil, who said. We prayed and praise the Lord. We got electricity. We're back on. So, so uh, you know, the, the, the airlines don't understand miracles, though. You know, they, they, don't, they don't look kindly on that. But I didn't know that. They just told me the airport was not open until today. I didn't know I was flying into an airport that wasn't open. They didn't tell me that. They didn't tell me that. I had no idea. It was your faith that got that. I had no idea. Um, <laughs> wow. But it's a joy to be here. It's always like coming home, and you guys are, have such a wonderful spirit. It's so special here. Uh, truly a, a manifestation of one new man and how you celebrate the feast. And I know you've been through so much with a hurricane, but now you are praising the Lord for the Feast of Tabernacles, as Israel is as well. And you guys were so pra praising so much. You know, Pastor Phil turned to me and says, we have a lot of crazy Gentiles. I said, yes, and I love crazy Gentiles. God loves crazy Gentiles. That's why he made so many of them. The church is built on crazy Gentiles and crazy Jews, too. Crazy for the Lord, right? I just actually came. I was in Washington, D.C. There is the gathering. I don't know if you saw it or praise God for it. It was hundreds of thousands of women on the National Mall and men as well. And we there smashed the altar of Ishtar of sexual immorality, and we need to pray for that, pray for that, and for this election. Now, I have a lot to share with you, um, but no matter how much I do, I, I can only, of course, give you a taste. There's so much more. So for that reason, as soon as I finish, I'm going to do what I did since the first time I ever came here, um, and that is I'm going to go over wherever they have the books. You know where that is, and um, as soon as it ends, I'll meet you there. Um, my job is to get the word out by by speaking it, but also by writing. And this is to bless you, and I know you guys are, have been amazing. You always scoop up the books, um, not only for yourselves, but you do it for people in your life, and that's the whole, that's my hope. Even if you have the, some of the books, get it to give to other people. We try to make it available so it's real easy to do that. So, um, so let me tell you what they're going to do. They're going to do something special as they do each year. Let me tell you what they have. Um, these are the books they're going to have tonight, and these are some of the first one is the Oracle. And this opens up, and they'll probably put up, this, was, this will open up the Jubilee and Mysteries of Israel, also links to what happened, really where we are right now, some stunning things about the end of the age and, and uh, the mysteries of God. Second is the paradigm. That opens up a biblical mystery that gives exact dates and people's uh, events. It may even, may even tell us what's going to happen with this next election here. That is the paradigm. The next one is the Book of Mysteries, which is going to take you on a journey to a Middle Eastern desert and open up uh, mind-blowing mysteries of God for every day of your life. And also people are, all these books, but this one, people are giving it to unsaved people, and they have no unsaved person has ever rejected it, and they're getting saved by that. Um, all of these books are for that. The next one is The Return of the Gods. I shared it here. Um, and that is explosive. It is the ancient gods and spirits that have returned, that are, that are behind what's happening in our culture. We can actually identify them um, and deal with them. So the return of the gods. And the next one is the one I just wrote last year. It's the Josiah Manifesto, and I shared it. The ancient mystery and guide for the end times. What if God was giving us a guide about what to know, what to do, um, how to stand strong in the end times, and where we are right now? The newest book, as Pastor Phil, I'll give you a little taste tonight, is the Dragon's Prophecy. It just came out. Um, there's something about it, um, and I don't boast, but I do boast in God. And I would just say, because I didn't even plan on writing this book. I was writing another one, and he interrupted me and said, no, this is the one. Um, and so this is all God, but what God did is when this just debuted, uh, just in September, God had it that it debuted as the number one book in the world by the hand of God, totally the hand of God. And so, and, and as I'm writing it, it's kind of, it's coming true, and I had to keep on rewriting, because it kept coming true as I'm doing it. 
So that'll be there. Most of, of all these, are, they're all hard covers. The new, and the newest one lists around $30 or so. But what they're going to do is we try to make it real easy and to bless you. And that is it's going to be $15. But if you get, as you get one, one more, two, it's going to go down and down and down until it's $10, which is now really less than a Big Mac meal at McDonald's. But you cannot save anybody with a Big Mac. I want to remind you that. But you can save people with this. So it's to make it so easy for you. So take advantage of it. It's the lowest on earth right now here. Last thing before we begin, I have to show you we have one more special resource that uh, is not available. You cannot get it on Amazon. You can't get it in a bookstore or Walmart. This I only usually make available where I speak live. It's the Dragon's Prophecy Uncensored. This is eight one-hour DVDs where you're not just going to hear it. You're going to see the mysteries unfold. It has uncensored material, which I couldn't even put in the book. Mysteries that are nowhere else. I put nowhere else in the world. It's only on here. Um, and also the mystery that may even enable you to know what is going to happen and when it's going to happen. So this is nowhere else. Uh, so take advantage. That'll be out there. It comes out to like something like four or five dollars per DVD. So uh, it'll be very blessed. If it runs out, I don't have it. You, you can't get it elsewhere. That's it. If you want to get prophetic updates or free gifts, CDs, if you haven't already done that, there's a sheet. Just put your contacts um, and we'll send you that up there. Or you can go to hopeoftheworld.org, which is the ministry that we do this. And that's it. Are we ready? Father, we just praise you and thank you, Lord. Thank you for this night, Father. We thank you, Father, for, Lord, this sacred gathering of your people. Lord, we just praise you. Lord, speak, touch. Lord, I ask in my weakness, be strong in your power and have your way. And we thank you, Lord, in the name above every name, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our King. Amen. Okay, I'm going to give a little taste of the kind of the newest revelation that I that the Lord led me to share, and that is I did not plan on writing this. I was actually beginning to write The Return of the Gods, the sequel to that, which I will do, but I was interrupted by what was happening around the world, what was happening, what the Lord led me to do. I was praying and should I do this? And, and the Lord, I, I just saw a dragon, a red dragon, and I knew that was from the book of Revelation. And I've never written a book that so much opened up the realm of end time prophecy. Or again, where I keep, had to keep updating it because it kept happening as I'm doing it. Is there more to the world than the world sees, or the forces and prophecies and entities? Are we living in the last days? What does the future hold? What does this have to do with each of us? Pastor Phil alluded to it. Let me give you a little more detail. It was a Friday night at Beth Israel, the congregation I lead in, in New Jersey. And I was led to share of a biblical mystery fr uh, from the book of Leviticus. That mystery ordained, that I'm not saying I know all these things, God though does. And that mystery ordained that there would be an attack on the land of Israel. It would take place in the year 2023. It would happen in the month of October. It would take place on a Saturday. It would happen on a Hebrew holy day that went back to Leviticus. It would lead to war. The mystery ordained that there would be a calamitous invasion of Israel on the first Saturday of October of the year 2023. The first Saturday of October of 2023 fell on October 7th. I shared it on Friday night on October 6th. Next morning, it happened. Now, this is one of the mysteries. This is what led to the book. That one of the mysteries of the book that may enable us to know, again, what is going to happen when it's going to happen. In fact, after I finished writing it, three other events happened according to this same biblical mystery. Goes back to near the beginning when God created an entity, but that entity said... I am a God. I sit in the seats of God. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the Most High. He turned from God. He turned against the Most High. His name in Hebrew is Hasatan, which means the one who goes against, the opposer. In English, it became Satan, became Satan. It was translated into Greek. It became Diabolos. We get the word devil from that the slanderer. His mission is to 
stop the will of God, to oppose it, to destroy it, to pervert it, to negate it, to nullify it. He seeks to destroy God, but he cannot. So he will seek to destroy the works of God, the, the creation of God, and the people of God. But then God br brings another entity into the world, and that entity is called Israel and the Jewish people. Why did they come into the world? God brought them into the world to bring God's purposes into the world, to, uh, to accomplish God's purposes. So they, through Israel, they brought his word to the world. They brought his, his, the knowledge of God, the presence of God. They brought God, Messiah, into the world, and they will bring God back into the world. And they will bring the kingdom of God into the world. So what's going to happen? On one side, you have an entity that says, I'm going to destroy the works of God, the purpose of God. On the other hand, you have an entity that exists to bring the purpose of God into existence. You're going to have a war. You're going to have a war. And so even if we didn't know anything about the earth, and we didn't know anything about history, we came from another planet, but all we knew was these two things from the Bible, we would know that this people, Israel, would become the most warred against people the most hated people, the most persecuted people, the most slandered people on earth. All hell would come against this people. We would expect the Jewish people would be the object of all hell. And that's exactly what's happened. They were warred against in the ancient world, warred against in the medieval world, warred against in the modern world, hated by the left, hated by the right, Hated by the religious, hated by the secular. Hated by the Nazis, hated by the radical Muslims. Hated by the woke. Hated by the communists, they said they're capitalists. Hated by the capitalists, they said they're communists. Hated by the status quo, they said they're revolutionary. Hated by the revolutionary, they said they're status quo or colonial. Hated for keeping to themselves, hated for not keeping to themselves. Hated for having no nation of their own, hated for having a nation of their own. The hatred never makes sense, it's irrational. It changes. It's not natural, it's supernatural. You see, the first anti-Semite wasn't a king or a leader. The first anti-Semite was an angel, was a fallen angel. That's why all attempts to try to explain this away are things like Hitler, you can't explain it because it's not natural. Because you can't do it because it is supernatural and it never dies. It's no accident that the most evil people in the world just happen to be obsessed with the Jewish people. Hitler, Stalin, Bin Laden, Hamas, because the most evil of creatures is obsessed with the Jewish people. So the history of the Jewish people in the world testifies that God exists. But the history of the Jewish people also, it also testifies that the devil exists. Because the devil knows he can't destroy God, but if he can destroy the Jewish people, he can stop the purposes of God. He can stop the kingdom of God. You know, when the news came all across the world from October 7th, people were shocked. But it was only the latest battle in an ancient war that began long before any of us were born. You see, the enemy doesn't die. So the war goes on. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, a vision is given. A woman crowned with 12 stars, and she gives birth to a child. The child is the Messiah. Well, that can only be one, one thing. 12 stars, birth to Messiah, that woman is Israel. Then another sign appears in the heavenlies, a red dragon. The dragon is the enemy. The dragon wars against the woman. In the Greek, it says he persecutes the woman. He rages against the woman. And this vision was recorded 2,000 years ago. And yet it accurately describes what has taken place in history since that time. And yet the focus of the vision is the beginning of the age when Messiah was on earth and then ascended to heaven. And the end of the age, so what, is, what do those two things have in common? Israel is in the land. God said through the prophets, in the last days, God, he would gather, I will gather the children of Israel from the ends of the earth, and I will bring them back to their land. 
Israel would be resurrected from the dead as dry bones becoming a living people. And so it's all come true even in our own day. But now a mystery that lies behind one of the most controversial issues of our time that's used against Israel all the time. And you'll never hear it from CNN or MSNBC, just in case you were expecting to hear it from them. The dragon, see, see, once you take away the veil, you can see why what is happening is happening. With, with, it all makes sense. But it's not, it's not physical, it's spiritual. The dragon is a mimic. He imitates God. He comes, he wants to come as an angel of light. He imitates the Messiah with the anagram. He's an imitator. So what did God do in modern times? He resurrected an ancient nation onto the world stage. So what is the enemy going to do? The enemy is going to have his own form of resurrection. He's going to resurrect another nation, another people. Which one? Well, he's the enemy. So he's going to resurrect an enemy nation, people that were ancient enemies of Israel. He would resurrect them to f war against Israel, destroy Israel if it could. What people in the Bible were the arch enemies of Israel? They were called the Philistines, Goliath, and all throughout the whole Bible. Is it possible that the enemy actually could resurrect this ancient people? Well, he has, because now there's a people, and we have to pray for them. It's not about the people. We love all people, pray for all people, but people can be used by the enemy. Who are they? They are called today, it is called the Palestinians. The word, but people have no idea. The word Palestinian, you know what it means? It means the Philistines. In fact, the, you, in the language of the Palestinian, the word Palestinian is not Palestinian. The word is Philistini. They actually are called the Philistines. So when people call, talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, they're really saying the Israeli-Philistine conflict. When they talk about the Israeli, an Israeli, a two-state solution, Israel and a Palestinian state, they're saying Israel and a Philistine state. And you know... You know when this all began? When God started raising up Israel, this, this Philistine resurrection started right after it, as if to counter the first. Do you know where the ancient Philistines dwelt? It was a region in the Bible called Pinashet. In your Bibles, it will say probably Philistia. Does it exist today? It does. But it's called by a different name. Ancient Philistia is now called the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is ancient Philistia, where the Philistines dwelt. And you know when? You know, Gaza always existed. But you know when? Gaza Strip did not exist until, you know when it came back into the world? In 1948, the very year Israel was resurrected. In fact, what happened is the people called Philistine, they went to, we went to the Gaza Strip, Philistia, the land of the Philistines, and the Jewish people, the is people of Israel, went to the land of Israel. At the same moment, and the dragon is using them. They don't know they're being used. They're using them as pawns to oppose what God is doing with Israel. You know, when people want, you know, Palestine to prevail and take the place of Israel, they're saying we want the Philistine, the Philistine state to take the place of Israel. So as the Jewish people begin conforming to the ancient Israelites, they're, they're soldiers again, they're farmers again, so this other people are being conformed into the image of the ancient Philistines. And the ancient Philistines, the Bible says, had a hatred for Israel that just went on and on in each generation. What happened on October 7th was an ancient mystery replaying before the, before the eyes of the world as orchestrated by the enemy, the dragon. You know, the Bible says the ancient Philistines used to launch invasions of Israel from the Gaza Strip. What is now the Gaza Strip, they would launch invasions, raids into Israeli villages. And they would brutalize them. And they would take, they would take Israelites captive, hostage, back to Gaza. Now listen to the words of a Bible commentary written before this all happened. Of the ancient Philistine invasions of Israel, it says, Gaza waged border warfare. This is about the Bible verses in which defenseless Judean villages were overpowered and acts of extreme barbarity were performed. This is from a Bible commentary, but this was October 7th. In fact, the Bible, 
identifies two areas that the ancient Philistines would target when they invaded from the Gaza Strip. And it's, it's the Negev and the Shephelah. When you look at where these two converge, it converges into a kind of not a big area of land where they all come together. And it was that little part of land where that music festival was being hold, held. That's where the kibbutzes were. They would take them captive to Gaza as hostages. There are right now hostages in Gaza that we need to pray for their release. There are so many mysteries here, but I want to, and, and in all that happened a year ago. But the fact is God actually used his prophets to condemn Gaza. And you know what they condemned Gaza for? Specifically for taking Israelis hostage. And it's not like Hamas had any idea of this. But the enemy has a long memory. In the book of Revelation, the dragon spews a flood against the woman Israel to flood her away. He comes against the Jewish people as a flood. The enemy comes in like a flood. Hamas gave a name for the invasion that happened a year ago that started everything that's happening right now. Gave a name for it. They called it, in, in shorthand, Operation Tufan. Tufan is an Arabic word. What does it mean? Operation Tufan means, operation it means flood. The flood, like the dragon's flood. What happened that day was not political. It wasn't ideological. It was demonic. It was a desecration. Because, see, the enemy is a desecrator. He takes what is holy, and he defiles it. So it's no accident. And we can't, I can't go into detail tonight on these things, but it's no accident that on that day, October, it all happened on October 7th, because October 7th, on that day, three holy days of God converged into one day. Such a holy day that the enemy could not resist, resist defiling it. There's a mystery that comes from the Jubilee. In the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, came restoration and redemption, freedom and return. If you lost your land in the year of Jubilee, you got it back. You came home. You, lost, you, you got back what you lost. Now, no people have ever so lost their land as the Jewish people. No people have ever been so separated from the land. And so God said, though, in the last days, I'm going to bring you back to the land. And the amazing thing is, it's a, it's a jubilee. It's a prophetic jubilee. And the thing is, it's amazing, because God did the restoration of Israel according to the mystery of the jubilee. It, just, I'm going to give you a quick nutshell, because there's so much to this, too. In the year 1867, that was the year that the sultan of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, who controlled the land, they occupied it, released the land that Jewish people could actually start buying it, redeeming it back, and in that year, 1867, was a year of Jubilee. Count 50 years later to the next Jubilee. What year do you come to? It comes to the year 1917. Anything happen? 1917, the Jubilee, the one who occupies your land has to get out. 1917, World War I, the British come in. The Turks get out for the first time in Cedric. Get out. The, the occupiers are gone, and the British Empire issues the Balfour Declaration, which pronounces the land of Israel shall be given back to the children of Israel. Jubilee, everyone shall return to their own land. But they didn't have Jerusalem. So what happens, though, if you count 50 years? Next Jubilee comes to the year 1967. Anything happen in that year? That year, the Six-Day War breaks out. On the third day of that war, the soldiers of Israel enter the gates of Jerusalem, the holy city, for the first time in 2,000 years. God restores Jerusalem to its original owner, Jubilee. And we should be glad he did because Messiah can only come back because of that. But they, in the Jubilee, you get back the legal recognition. You don't, you get the le you don't just go, go on your land. You, get, you are recognized by everyone. It's your legal right. But the world refused to give that to Israel. The world, the only capital in the world that the world refuses to recognize, Jerusalem. But what happens if you count 50 years to the next Jubilee? What does it take you to? The year 2017. Anything happen that year? That year, the United States, under President Donald Trump, issues the Jerusalem Declaration, <laughs> recognizing Jerusalem as the legal right of the Jewish people after 2,000 years. First world leader. 
And I, I, got, I got to throw this in. I got, have to throw this in. And that is that in the year, in the Six-Day War, in the, in the restoration of Jerusalem, as the soldiers got to the Temple Mount, the sound of the Jubilee sounded forth from the Temple Mount and from the Western Wall. Because there was a rabbi, and he wasn't doing it because he was thinking of all that we're talking about. He just was led to do it. A rabbi sounds it. His name was Rabbi Goren, Rabbi Shlomo Goren. He sounds it. Rabbi Goren was born in 1917, the other jubilee. So he is now 50 years old. It's his jubilee. He sounds the shofar of Israel's jubilee. And the name Goren means horn. It's Rabbi Horn sounding the horn in the jubilee. God is perfect. But 50 years later comes the legal restoration, and it centers on a president, President Trump. Horn, Rabbi Horn, President Trump. I think God has a sense of humor. But the enemy is an imitator. So he's going to take the jubilee of God, and he's going to turn it against Israel. The Jubilee brings freedom and blessing and restoration. He's going to turn it around against Israel. There is one thing. These are all victories, but there was one thing that was a calamity for Israel. Actually, it was the greatest calamity for the nation of Israel until October 7th. It was a surprise attack. It was called the Yom Kippur War. Israel was caught by surprise, an attack on the ground, and it was so severe that Israel actually thought they were going to be destroyed. It was the end of Israel. So much so, the prime minister almost committed suicide. They thought it was the end. They were caught totally by surprise. By a miracle, they turned it around. They ended up winning, but it shook them up from that time forward into the 21st century. So the enemy's going to take a calamity, and he's going to make his own jubilee. The Yom Kippur War... Happened in the year 1973. Count 50 years. Where does that take you? It takes you to the year 2023. The Yom Kippur War happened in the month of October. So the Devil's Jubilee is going to happen in the month of October. The Yom Kippur War happened on a Saturday, a Sabbath. So what we just had saw happened on a Sabbath day. The Yom Kippur War took place on a Hebrew holiday that went back to Leviticus 23. So the devil's jubilee is going to happen on a Hebrew holy day that goes back to Leviticus 23. The Yom Kippur War pinpointed that this jubilee would happen on the, fir it happened on the first Saturday of, of October 1973. So it's going to pinpoint the first Saturday of October of 2023. That comes out to October 7th. That was the devil's jubilee. It wasn't of restoration. It was of destruction. It wasn't of freedom. It was of bondage. There is a mystery to this. In fact, and there's, there's so much. There's, there's one of the mysteries. There's actually a prophetic countdown. One of them begins in the 20th century, and another one after. And it ends up coming down to its last day is the Saturday morning of October 7th. It's so exact. Now, the dragon's war, the enemy, stretches across the ages. In every generation, he raises up a vessel to be used by him upon... You know, so every generation sees another one. The generation before us saw Hitler and the Nazis. You know, before that, there was another. We see Hamas and, and all that. But every generation, there's like a passing of a torch. Could there be a passing of a torch? Well, there was. There was a man called, one of the mysteries that I, I share, there was a man, there was a man called, called Al-Husseini. He was also called the Mufti in Arabic. He was a hater of the Jewish people. He was responsible for the, the shedding of Jewish blood. He was going to be brought to trial, but he escaped the Middle East in the 20th century, and he went to Germany, and he went to Berlin, and he had a meeting with Adolf Hitler. And he formed an alliance, and he, he wanted to have Hitler bring the Holocaust to Israel. Hitler said he would do that in the right time. The Mufti became a, a, an employee of Adolf Hitler. He broadcast from Radio Berlin the, Hitler, the hatred of Hitler and Nazism into the Arab world, infecting them. After the war, he was going to be brought to trial in Nuremberg as a war criminal. He fled to Egypt. He was hailed as a hero, and he's known as the father of Palestinian nationalism, who was an employee of Adolf Hitler. There in Egypt, he meets an Egyptian teenager, takes him under his wing, trains him, disciples him. The teenager's name is Yasser Arafat. 
Yasser Arafat was trained by a man from Adolf Hitler. It goes from Adolf Hitler to the Mufti to Yasser Arafat. And that wasn't all. In the 1930s, Hitler funded a new organization to give it money and training and strength to get it on its feet. That, that organization was called the Muslim Brotherhood. It was that organization that gave birth to Hamas. In fact, Hamas is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, the founding charter of Hamas, you look at the words, it's the words of Adolf Hitler. There's an unbroken chain from Germany to, to the tunnels of Gaza that the only one who was alive through that whole thing is the dragon, the enemy. These are his fingerprints. That is what we're dealing with. And you know what the man that Hitler put in charge of the Holocaust, his name up was Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was placed in his position, you know, he was put in the position to do it, to start the Holocaust. He got, Hitler put him over all the conquered territories to begin the Holocaust. The day that Hitler chose to begin it was October 7th. Himmler was born 39 years before he came into the world on October 7th. October 7th was the anniversary of all those things. Hamas is a unique word. It's an acronym in Arabic. It means the Islamic Resistance Movement. But in, Ara in Arabic, it means zeal and fervor. But it's a, a unique word because it's not just Arabic. At the same moment, it's also a Hebrew word. So Hamas is an Arab word. It's a Hebrew word, and in Hebrew, it means something else. In Hebrew, Hamas, from ancient times, means evil, violence, and destruction. And it actually appears in the Bible. And the amazing thing, you know, God knows every word. He knows everything that's going to happen in the world. And so one of the things I open up in, in the book is where this appears in the Bible. For instance, let me give you an example in the original Hebrew. It says in your Bible, Lord, save me from the men of Hamas. It says, it says Hamas has risen up as a rod of evil. Hamas dwells in the city and the land is filled with crimes of bloodshed. You know how Hamas hides in the tunnels? In the Bible, it says Hamas dwells in the dark places of the earth. There's a command in the Bible where God says to the leaders of Israel, rid Hamas from the land. And there is a promise in the Bible when Messiah shall reign over the earth, it says there will be peace finally, peace for Israel, rest for Israel, and then it says this in Hebrew, and in that day, no more shall Hamas ever be heard in your land again. The largest section of the dragon's prophecy is the end of days. Because what happened a year ago and what's been happening since is actually linked to ancient prophecies of the end times. The end times, in Hebrew, the the yamim acharit, the acharit hayamim, the, the days of the end. It goes as far back as Moses is the first one who spoke about it. How will you know you're actually living in the end times? Well, you could have a checklist and check it off. The Bible says you'll be in the end times when you're in a world where Israel's been gone from that world and suddenly Israel comes back into that world. You're in the end times. The Bible says in the end times that world will be obsessed with this little nation the size of New Jersey. Well, it is. It makes no sense. It says, the Bible says that in that day all the nations shall not just be obsessed. They'll rage against Israel. They'll, there'll be hatred of Israel all around the earth. Sound familiar? You're there. We are in the end times. And it's actually accelerating. Since last year, there's so much that has happened. It goes with, now, now let, me, let me give you a little taste. I can just give you some. In the book of Revelation, there are colors. The, the apocalypse has colors. I talk about the colors of the apocalypse in the book. The four horsemen. The first horse was white. The second horse was red. The third horse was black. And the fourth horse was green. White for conquest, red for war, black for famine, and green for death. So it's a striking thing. Because all over the world, wherever there is hatred for Israel... Wherever there's rage against Israel, the colors of the apocalypse are manifest. How? Well, when, you, when the, those who they rage against Israel, they do so, they do it under a banner. The banner is the flag of Palestine, the Philistine flag. What's the colors? 
white for the white horse, red for the red horse, black for the black horse, and green for the green horse, the colors of the apocalypse. In fact, every nation that has those colors as the colors of their flag, it marks them as an enemy of the nation of Israel. The prophet Ezekiel foretold that in the last days, when Israel comes back into the world from the ends of the earth, there will come a massive alliance of nations, and they will make war. They will invade the land of Israel. He identifies them by name. And from that prophecy, prophecy we can identify several of them by that place. One is called Cush, which answers to the Sudan, biblical Ethiopia. Another is called Put, answers to Libya and North Africa. Another is Togarma and a number of others that are all Asia Minor. That's Turkey. Another is Persia. That is Iran. And the issue of Russia is, for, is also mixed in here. But I saw a, a, an amazing thing in that, you know, the nations that Ezekiel says they're going to they're partake in an invasion of Israel, and they never have. Those nations never have. They share something in common. Cush, Sudan, actually took part in the Hamas invasion of October 7th. Put, the other one, Ezekiel says, also took part in the invasion of Israel. They were behind it. They, they, they gave weapons. They fund. Togarma, Turkey, also participated in that invasion of Israel. And Persia, Iran, definitely in, was behind that invasion of Israel. They have never done that before in history. First time ever we have crossed a prophetic red line. They have actually partaken in an invasion of Israel. We are getting closer. In that prophecy... It said, God says, they will come on the land like a storm. It'll be like a storm. And now this is still all to come, but we're seeing the first shadows here. The invasion of Hamas, I told you they called it Operation Tufan. Tufan means the flood from Revelation. But Tufan also means the storm from Ezekiel. When you pull back the veil, you see what the world cannot see. One of the spiritual entities the Bible reveals... Thousands of years ago is an ancient demonic entity that wars against Israel. It wars against the purposes of God, particularly for the last days of Israel. It is called in Hebrew the Sar Paras. Sar means ruler, lord, or general. Paras means the nation of Iran. This demonic entity is actually connected to a nation of Iran. You want to understand what's happening in the world today? You want to understand geopolitics? You have to understand the spirits, the spiritual. If the Tsar Paras, this entity, is impelling Iran, ruling Iran, or influencing Iran, what would we expect to happen? We would expect that when Israel comes back into the world, sooner or later, Iran is going to become anti-Israel. We would expect Iran to become exactly what Iran has become. It is the arch enemy of Israel in the world. And the spirit, you know, why is Iran obsessed with the nation of Israel? Because it is being led by a spirit that is obsessed with the nation of Israel. Why is Iran trying to get nuclear weapons to destroy Israel? Because the spirit behind it is trying to destroy the nation of Israel. You see, it's what's happened. There's a war in the heavenly realms. That's why what we're seeing is a war on earth. But it's all from the heavenly and, so, and the nations that try to control Iran, they, it never works. They think they're dealing with a nation. They're dealing with a spirit. And you cannot contain a spirit with diplomacy. So it's no accident that the Houthis right now that are warring against Israel, behind them is Iran. Behind Iran is the spirit, the Tsar Paras. Behind the Hezbollah firing the missiles, right now there's war on both sides. And behind them is Iran. Behind Iran is the Tsar Paras. October 7th. Behind that was the Gazans. Behind the Gaza was Hamas. Behind Hamas was Iran. Behind Iran was the Sar Paras. Behind the Sar Paras was the dragon. Ezekiel prophesied that in the last days Iran would attack Israel. Now that the attack is still yet to come, but Iran has never attacked Israel directly. They use others, but they never directly did until this year. For the first time in history, what Ezekiel said is going to happen, it's still going to happen. We crossed another prophetic line. Iran fired hundreds of missiles and drones into the land of Israel. 
And the world, and it happened again, just about like two and a half weeks ago. And the world watched on edge, it's still on edge, about what, the, because would this trigger a world war? Amazing. It all goes back to this, this entity that is seeking to destroy Israel and even trigger a world war, the Tsar Paras. But there's another side to the story. Because in the same prophetic book that reveals the Tsar Paras, the entity of Iran, it reveals another entity. The name of this entity means who is like God, or in Hebrew, me, Ha, El, or we know him as Michael. Michael, if you're real spiritual, you call him Mike, but be careful with that. <laughs> it says Michael, Michael, is actually the Tsar Yisrael. He's the general of Israel. He, it says he will fight for Israel in the last days. That's why Israel's still here. And so behind Iran, you have the Tsar Paras. Behind Israel, you have the Tsar Yisrael warring in the heavenlies. That is why the two nations are at war on earth. And this conflict has the whole world on edge. And yet when Iran fi has fired those hundreds of missiles, by the way, you know the last attack was the, was the greatest missile attack in world history? 99% of those missiles in the, in, in the attack were struck down. And I was told that a professor made a study of it and discovered that statistically it was impossible for, for Israel's defense systems to do that in that time. I have no doubt there was another hand at work in the heavenlies in the war doing this, the Tsar Yisrael, Michael. You see, the other side of the story is behind the defense of Israel is the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. But behind the Israeli Defense Force is the Tsar Yisrael, Michael, Michael. And behind, behind Michael is Messiah, Yeshua, and he is God, the God of Israel. <laughs> Ebrahim Raisi. He was the first president of Iran to actually strike Israel, touch Israel, attack Israel. His name, Ebrahim He's named after Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. And he wanted to destroy the Jewish people. His name means Abraham. And it also bears witness to an Abrahamic covenant which says, if you bless Israel, I bless you. If you curse Israel, I will curse you. He wanted to destroy them. Israel is called the apple of God's eye. You touch Israel, you touch the apple of God's eye. Racy sent those missiles to bring destruction. He touched the apple of God's eye. About 30 days later, Racy is struck down dead. Struck dead. His helicopter goes mysteriously down. As he had sent airborne and airborne objects into the skies of Israel to bring destruction upon their crashing, now Racy is in an airborne object that brings destruction upon its crashing. Whatever you do to Israel will be done back. He had issued a threat to Israel, threatening it with annihilation that people don't realize. They made headlines after he sent the missiles. What he did was blasphemy. Because Israel is God's nation. You cannot destroy it. It's eternal. But the day before he went in that helicopter was the Sabbath. And all around the world on the Sabbath, there was a scripture that Jewish people were reciting. It was appointed from ages past for that Sabbath. And the end of that scripture in Israel and around the world, they recite the words, the words say, the man who spoke the blasphemy shall be put to death. The next day, he was. In Ezekiel's prophecy, God says that the enemies of Israel, those, those who will attack Israel, he, will he says, I will bring you against the mountains. You will fall upon the mountains. Racy was the first leader of those nations that actually attacked Israel. On that day, his helicopter went down he was brought down upon the mountains. He fell upon the mountains. There are many more mysteries of the end times. One big one, I can't, we don't have time, but it's called the secret of the mountain. Just to say that behind what happened on October 7th was a mystery from the, it all behind, the whole thing was a mystery from the Temple Mount that is linked to the book of Revelation and look to, linked to what is going to come. In fact, 
Behind 9-11, September 11th, was also the Temple Mount and a mystery to Revelation. But to bring now, to start bringing this home to you, everything is accelerating. In the wake of the attack of October 7th and the shedding of innocent blood, you'd expect the world to rise up in sympathy. Instead, there's a mass wave of hatred for Israel all over the world, calling for more blood. That doesn't make any sense. It was as if the shedding of Jewish blood triggered a feeding frenzy in the demonic realm. And that outbreak wasn't just in the Islamic world. It was in Europe. It was in America. It was in Harvard University. They chanted, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. They were chanting for the destruction of Israel. But again, the fact that the dragon's fingerprints are all over it. Because what he takes the things of God and he twists them against God. The, you know where that comes from? From the river to the, That comes from the Bible. It's the promise that God gave to the children of Israel that I have given the land to you from the river to the sea. I have given you that land from the river to the sea. So the enemy inverts it. His fingerprints are all over. What does the Bible say of the last days? It speaks of the, the nations coming against Israel, the beast who will be like his, his father, the dragon, will be a hater of Israel. And think about it. Who was it who led this global rage against Israel? The young. That included young Americans. They did a survey. They found out that young Americans, almost a majority of them, do not support Israel but support Hamas. And they, they were in favor of what Hamas did to Israel. They said it was justified. The Bible says in the last days, you want to see the future, in the last days all nations will come against Israel. That might be so, that sounds crazy. How could the whole world come against this little New Jersey nation? Well, you've already, see, you've already gotten a taste of it. You've already gotten a taste of it. That it'll be the dragon's rage that will infect. You know, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says out of the dragon's mouth came, a, came spirits that went all over the earth and gathered the nations to Armageddon. Do you know what just happened at the U.N. just about two and a half weeks ago? The U.N., by 124 nations in favor, passed a resolution to saying that much of the land that Israel has is illegal, including Jerusalem. And they voted 124 versus 14 they're, that they're giving Israel 12 months to get out of Jerusalem. <laughs> Actually happened. That makes no sense. You know, it says, why do the nations rage? It says, the Lord laughs. They're not going anywhere. What does the Bible say? The last days, though, nations will come against Israel over Jerusalem. It's biblical. Do you know that the U.N., has condemned Israel in the last period, not, not only more than any other nation, but more than all nations of the earth put together. Twice as many. So what does this have to do with us? We're watching end time prophecy fulfilled. In the vision of the dragon, it says he went to make war with the, not just the woman, but the rest of her children. Who are the rest of her children? If you are a follower of Messiah, if you're born again, the Bible says you are a child of Israel as well, a son, daughter of Abraham, a citizen of Israel. The enemy hates you. You are a child of Israel. He wages two wars, one against Israel physically and one against the spiritual Israel spiritually. And in the last days, that war is going to intensify. So whenever Israel's attacked, it's a sign that the, the dragon is seeking to attack you. He hates you as well. And even if you're listening to this message and you're not of Israel and you're not of Messiah, you're not saved. Well, you know what? The enemy hates anyone in the image of God. And so whoever you are, from the moment you were conceived, he has declared war against your life. He's warred against some of you by wounding you, some by rejecting you, some by ensnaring you, some by having you in bondage and addictions, some by the anger of man, some by abuse, some by depression, some by oppression, some lost, some kept from God, some he wants to take, take away. He's called the enemy because he, he's the enemy of everyone. And if you are a child of God, you are a child of Israel. No matter who you are, you're in the image of God. So you, he is war that I'm talking about tonight is against you personally. 
And so if he's going to be get, come, warring against Israel and the church in the last days, which he is, more and more, it means Israel and the church have, got, have to come together. It's already happening. You can see it right here. But it's going to happen more. See, at the end of the age, the Jewish people return to where they were at the beginning of the age, which was the land of Israel. The world is now returning to where it was at the beginning of the age, to paganism. That means it's time for the church, us, to return to where we were at the beginning of the age, which is called the book of Acts. It's not a people who are of the status quo, but it's a revolutionary people. It's not a people who are of a darkened culture. They are countering the culture. There are people who are, they were on fire, radical, all out as the apostles and disciples that they actually changed the world. And that brings us to something as I'm, I'm bringing this home to, to all of us. Because the last part of the dragon's prophecy is all about your, the war that he has against, how, the strategies he has against you and how to fully overcome it. And that brings something out. I call it in the book, The Mystery of the Secret Israelis. You see, if you're born again, you know, you might say, okay, I know I'm, I'm spiritually Jewish. Or I'm a spiritual Israelite. You're not just a spiritual Israelite. There's no word in Hebrew for Israelite or that says Israelite. The word is Israeli. If you are born again, you are a spiritual Israeli. What does that tell you? Well, the, it means that the, God has uses Israel to teach us something. They are in the physical to the world. We are in the spiritual. It is to tell us something. And let me put it this way. Let me get a little bit. It is said that most Italian men have good fight stories. Most Irish men, good fight stories. Jewish people, not so much. We have good almost fight stories. We almost got into the fight, but we didn't. We almost got in. If he said one more word, one more word, we would have got it. Nobody knows what the word is. That's the problem. <laughs> I actually have a real good almost fight story, but I'm not going to tell it to you tonight. But you see, for ages, the Jewish people weren't allowed to fight. They weren't taken into armies. They had no land. But in ancient times, they were. But when they came back to the land of Israel, they realized something. If we don't fight, we're going to be wiped away. Why? Because the dragon hates them. So the survivors of the Holocaust and the persecutions of the world, who had always been known as victims, they put on army fatigues, they took weapons that were used or smuggled or broken, and they learned how to fight. And God anointed them to become among the most greatest fighters on this planet by God. Well, you are the spiritual Israelis. And so in the last days, you, we also have to become warriors in the spirit, courageous, valiant fighters in the spirit. What does that mean? It means you don't take what the enemy says. You don't take what the enemy wants to do. You don't go along with it. In your culture, you don't go along with it. You fight the good fight. You resist the darkness. You say no to the enemy, no to his plans for your life. You say no to his plans for your walk. You say, no, I'm not going to do his bird, his temptations, his, his discouragement, his intimidation, his fear, and his depression. You say, no, I'm going to fight it. I'm not going to go along with it. Now I'm going to fight it. Israel became fighters. You have to become a fighter. We have to be fighters. You know, because the, the ancient Israelites were warriors. And you know what? The ancient, the first believers were warriors in the spirit. We have to become like the first disciples and apostles and giants of the faith who were warriors who went against the flow and did it with victory. You see, in the book of Revelation, it's not just about a dragon. It's about the lamb. You see, evil comes like a dragon. Intimidate to overwhelm you and, to, and make you afraid. But good comes like a lamb. It seems like the odds are against it. It seems like it's going to lose. It seems like it's not on the winning side. And in a fight of the dragon and a lamb, most people would put their bets on a dragon. But in Revelation, the dragon doesn't win. The lamb wins. The lamb wins. The lamb wins. Because in the end, it's the lamb who always wins. The lamb is victorious. 
The lamb reigns. The lamb is Messiah. He might look like he's down, like on the cross, but you know he's going to get up and he's going to overcome and be victorious. See, see, dragons are reptilian. They're cold-blooded. And dra dragons, reptiles can, can lash out, but they, they have no endurance. They can't last long. Evil has no endurance. It is not going to win because it can't win. It's not going to last because it cannot last in the end. Evil has a day, but joy comes in the morning. The lamb is warm-blooded. Good, good will win because good cannot lose. In the end, it cannot fail. You know, in the middle, it looks tough, but it's going to win. It cannot lose. His love endures forever. And so in the vision, the same vision of the dragon, Revelation 12, is the word that comes to us that says, but they overcame him. They overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and loving not their lives. They won. And the word for overcome here is the Greek word nakao, which is really cool. It means overcome and have total victory and conquer. But the cool thing is it's written of the future, but it's written in the past tense. In other words, the battle that you have to fight is already won. You just have to fight it. You, got, you won't see it. Unless, you can't have victory unless you fight. It's guaranteed. If you fight, you win. The victory is as good as done. You want victory? Fight in the Lamb. In the Lamb is all victory. You are guaranteed. Fight your good fight. Never give up. Never give in. Never stop. Stand. And the last thing I'm going to say to you is this tonight. I, I can only give you a taste, but the last thing I want to make sure I give it to you. You know, a lot of you, are, you're, everybody's involved with something. Everybody has a struggle. Everybody has a challenge. Everybody has a concern. Everybody has the fight. Everybody has that. And sometimes you wonder, Lord, am I, am I going to win? It looks like I'm overwhelmed. But let me tell you this. The Jewish people, the enemy has been trying to destroy them for 4,000 years. With all hell, all his might has been trying to wipe them out. And for much of that time, they didn't even have an army. They didn't even have a nation. They had nothing. And there's no way they should exist. The pharaohs of Egypt try to wipe them out. Assyria tried to destroy them. Babylon tried to crush them. Rome tried to annihilate them. Hitler tried to exterminate them. The Soviet Union tried to crush them. The terrorists promised they're going to destroy Israel. But, 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 the pharaohs are gone. Assyria is no more. Babylon has fallen. Rome is gone. Hitler is gone. Soviet Union gone. But, 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 the nation of Israel lives. Am Yisrael high. The nation of Israel lives because the God of Israel lives. Messiah of Israel lives. Yeshua of Israel lives. And you will live. You shall overcome. You will be there. For greater is he in you than he was in the world. And greater is the Lamb in you in the name above every name. Arise, man of God. Arise, woman of God. Arise and shine for your light has come and you shall overcome in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah.